Okay, so today I want to talk about CRISPR-Cas9. But not just CRISPR-Cas9, I want to talk about the delivery of the Cas9 and the G RNA, which you now know is the guide RNA, okay? So now that you know how the system works, let's talk about delivering these molecules to an insect. So let's take, for example, Aedes aegypti, which is the yellow fever mosquito. Let's say we want to engineer Aedes aegypti with CRISPR-Cas9, and we want to target a gene and knock it out with CRISPR-Cas9, okay? You know from the last lecture that there's a couple things we need to deliver. Um, in total, we need to deliver an RNP, which is the ribonucleoprotein complex. The ribonucleoprotein complex is made up of the Cas9 nuclease enzyme, and it's coupled with guide RNA. So these are the two pieces we need to deliver. And there's actually more if we're doing something more complicated. If we are, if our desire is to do an insertion, then we would also need to provide a template for homology directed repair. Now we covered that in the last lecture, but let's just focus now. Let's imagine we're gonna do a knockout. So we don't need the template, but we do need to provide these first two things into the Aedes aegypti, okay? So if you remember back to the developmental biology lecture on insects and the micro and the lectures that I've had that have covered microinjection, okay? We're going to use in most cases, we're going to use what's called microinjection to deliver components 1 and 2 into the insect embryo. And the insect embryo has to be early before the blastoderm stages. And just for a quick review, if you remember in Drosophila as, or in insects, in most insects as the embryo is developing, um, early on, early stages of development divide the posterior from the anterior. So that's sort of divided and the cells that we want to deliver these molecules to, remember there's sort of a dichotomy in growing organisms, which is somatic versus germline. This should all be review. The somatic cells, their entire function is to provide sort of like a wet machine that protects and conveys the germline. The germline are the only cells that get passed on to the next generation. And so those are the eggs and the sperm, okay? And so since our desire is to engineer Aedes aegypti in a means that is stable, that means it's gonna be passed on to the next generation, we have to use a process that's not just gonna engineer the somatic cells, we have to use a process that's gonna really target the germline for engineering so that our modification will be passed on to this next generation. So to do that, we have to microinject embryos, but we have to microinject them in a spot that's gonna convey that modification into the germline. And again, if you recall from developmental biology lecture, in the posterior region of the eggs, there's a region of cells right around here, or cell nuclei, right around the posterior end, okay? This is called the germ plasm. And the germ plasm what happens to the germplasm is as this organism develops in this egg, as it becomes a larvae, these cells in the germplasm right here, these cells end up becoming the germline. They end up forming the tissues and the structures of the testes and the ovaries, and they form those stem cells that lead to the next generation. Okay, so here's a question. Here's our egg. Here's anterior, here's posterior, here's our germplasm. Where do we want to microinject this egg? Do we want to inject it here? 
No. Do we want to inject it here? No. We want to take a needle and we want to inject it right here. So they will pierce these eggs. This is an 80 to Jibdi egg with a little needle and they'll use a little micro injector which is going to pump out some liquid into this region of the cell. Okay. And the cells have not actually formed cell membranes yet because this is before blastoderm formation. So these are just nuclei floating around in a syncytia in an insect, in a developing insect. Okay. So as soon as we deliver the components that we're trying to use to modify this insect into this region, we're going to hopefully get some modification of the germline cells. And then this organism would eventually develop into an adult. And how would we know if it had been modified? In theory, we would have a marker. Usually we have a marker for some sort of eye color. So in this case, we made a green fluorescent eye mosquito. And this is the F0 generation. We won't know if it's inherited until we do a cross and mate this thing. And usually what people will do is if they end up with two green eyes, two green eyed insects, and if one's a female and one's a male, they'll mate them together. And if the next generation, so this would be the F1s, if the F1 generation has green eyes, then you know you hit the germline. You hit the jackpot. Okay. So let's expand this right here. This is our needle. Okay. What is our needle injecting? Okay. We know from up here, I've already described this, it's injecting the RMP, or in theory, it's injecting components that can become the RMP. So let's talk about that. The two things we need to deliver are the Cas9 nuclease and the guide RNA. And the reason I want to talk about this is because there's many different ways in which to deliver these two molecules. So the first way is to deliver two plasmids. Okay, so let's draw these plasmids. Plasmid one and plasmid two. And the question is, what's in these plasmids? Okay, well, one of these is going to be, let me get a darker color, darker green. One of these is going to be an ORF of the Cas9 nuclease. So if you remember from the last lecture, we'll do SP Cas9. Okay. But that's not enough information. Um, this plasmid needs to express in Aedes aegypti. Okay. Because its role is to be micro-injected into the Aedes aegypti egg. And its role is to be immediately turned on and to express the Cas9 to deliver the Cas9 nuclease to this germline, okay? So it needs to have, the key thing is it needs to have a promoter that's going to drive the Cas9 in this germline, okay? So we had previous lectures discussing germline promoters. And a very, very common one is nanos. Okay, and I discussed the nanos messenger RNA for a very specific region reason. I discussed the nanos messenger RNA in the context of the developmental biology lecture. I said that the nanos messenger RNA was a maternal transcript uh, that was delivered by the mom and it helped to define axes of the developing embryo. So it's expressed very early on, okay? And the nanos gene has its own promoter, the nanos promoter. And if we put the nanos promoter, so let's say P nanos, if we put the nanos promoter 
driving the SPCAS9, you can bet that when we inject the plasmid into this developing embryo, the nanos promoter will turn on the Cas9 and the Cas9 will be expressed. Okay, so we have Cas9, that's good. Check component one. Now we need to deliver the guide RNA. So you can imagine on this next construct over here, we're going to have a region coding for guide RNA. Now keep in mind, this is a little bit different. Okay, and I just, this, is, this should be obvious, but I don't think it is to many people. Um, the SPCAS9, this plasmid on the left, that's going through the whole central dogma. Okay, we're delivering DNA. The nanos promoter is turning it on and causing it to be transcribed as RNA, messenger RNA which is then being translated to protein by ribosomes in the germline into the protein that is Cas9. In this case, in the second plasmid, that's not happening. We're delivering a DNA, okay? But the DNA is not coding for a protein, okay? It's coding for a special RNA. So it's gonna get transcribed, not into messenger RNA, into the guide RNA, okay? And the guide RNA then is gonna be complexing with the Cas9 protein to form the RNP, okay? Now in this case, even though it's RNA, we still have the same issue as this first plasmid in that we need a promoter a special promoter that's going to drive that guide RNA in the embryo, okay? And it could be something similar to the nanos promoter that's going to be turned on. Essentially what we want is we want something that's going to express at the same time that the nanos is expressing, and we want them to express in high levels, essentially, okay? So many times they'll have constitutive, like, virus promoters that are just always on. Maybe you'll see germline promoters like nanos but essentially we need a promoter, okay? So this is one mechanism by which we can deliver these two components, okay? So two plasmids, we can deliver them on two plasmids, but this is not the only way and this is not the best way. And there's pluses and minuses to this strategy of delivering it with two plasmids, okay? So let's talk about the, the cons. Okay, what are the cons of this strategy? One of the cons is that um, both of these plasmids have to travel through central dogma. And what I mean by that is one of our, one of our goals is to deliver these items into this embryo and to have them act immediately, quickly, okay? And we're slowing that process down by forcing these plasmids to go through the central dogma. We're delivering the most basal state of the central dogma. We're delivering DNA in the form of a plasmid, okay? That means that in order for us to get our modification, the DNA has to be transcribed to the messenger RNA and then translated to the Cas9 protein, which then has to complex with the guide RNA. All those are steps, molecular steps, that take time in terms of chemical reactions that are happening in the cell. They take time. So as soon as we inject the plasmid, we're not getting a modification. As soon as we inject the plasmid, we're initially getting transcription, which then needs to be translated, which then needs to be complexed with the guide RNA. So do you see how this is gonna be slower to act than a sort of different mode of delivery. Okay, so let's talk about a different mode of delivering the same thing. So let's expand this down here. Here's a second option, okay. The components are still the same. We still need to deliver a Cas9 nuclease and we still need to deliver guide RNA. That's never gonna change. But we can float down the central dogma and try to speed things up a little bit. So one of the things that we can do is if instead 
if instead we had clone, say, a Hiss 6, and it would have a nuclear localization signal, and it would be the SP Cas9. If we had instead cloned this ORF with an epitope tag, a Hiss 6 tag, into an E. coli expression plasmid, so this would be something like a pet vector or a PBAD vector, something with an arabinose operon or a LAC operon, which we could induce by adding either IPTG or arabinose, which would turn on this gene. We could express this Cas9 in E. coli, and we could run the purified product we could lyse the E. coli cells and run them over a column of metal beads, which would be nickel or cobalt. The nickel or cobalt would bind to that Hiss-6 tag, and we would have a column full of Hiss-6 nuclear localization signal SP-Cas9, which we could then elute into a tube, and we could freeze it down. We could make a bunch of these. We could make like a whole 100 of these tubes which are filled with this enzyme and we can put them, stick them in the freezer and they'd be good for a long time. Okay, now, now let's talk about our delivery. Now what we can deliver is every time we wanna do one of these microinjections, every time we wanna microinject into some eggs, we can take out one of these tubes from the freezer and we can thaw it out. It's filled with our already made protein Cas9. So it's already traveled through the central dogma. It did that in E. coli. And then we purified it. And so we just have a tube of purified protein, which is Cas9. So into the thing that we are microinjecting, we add this Cas9 protein. Okay. So I'll put this as one. We got the Cas9 protein. Check. Um, now we can still, we can do this a couple different ways. We can still mix it with our guide RNA plasmid, which got a special promoter, and we can inject this combination. So this is a different combination. We're injecting Cas9 protein, not a Cas9 plasmid, but we are still injecting a guide RNA plasmid. So what's gonna happen when we inject these into the cell? The protein's already gonna be there. It's gonna be ready to act. But it's still going to be, it's still going to work. It's going to work. All these are going to work. All these systems are going to work. And if you read papers, you'll see people that use these in different ways. And a lot of these different ways might just be the preferred way of the lab. Maybe they have these plasmids, they know they work, so they just stick with the, they just stick with doing it that way. They're not comfortable with going to the E. coli expression. They don't want to do it themselves. Okay. But in this scenario, in this scenario, you inject and the Cas9 protein, the protein is ready to go. The protein is, is, it doesn't need to go through the central dogma. It's already gone through it. Okay. But it still needs to wait for the guide RNA to get transcribed and then to come and complex with it to become that RNP. Okay. So this one is still a little bit slower, but this is sort of like the intermediate thing from the region, the, from the way I just described in the past. Okay. Now let's talk about the third way that we can do this actually. And there's a fourth. So this is this previous way was way one. This way was the way two. We'll talk about the way three and the way four. Okay. So the way three, the way three would be, let's now we do the same thing. We have the E. coli expressing the recombinant or the heterologous protein Cas9. We purify it from E. coli. So we already have the Cas9 protein. It's been flash frozen down in the freezer in Alquat. So we just pull one out and thaw it out, okay? What we can also do is we can mix in a tube. We can do an in vitro synthesis of guide RNA. So you know how I have previously in the past described PCR, and PCR is kind of like an in vitro synthesis of DNA. Well, you can do the same thing, sort of, with RNA. You just mix the components. You just need to mix the components. So there would be like a reverse transcriptase, which is gonna be taking DNA and making RNA, and there'd be some DNTPs, 
and you mix the components in the correct buffer in the test tube with a plasmid that's going to be the template for your guide RNA. Okay. And then in the tube, in a little reaction, we can synthesize a lifetime supply of our specific guide RNA. Okay. So we've essentially prior synthesized and we have tubes of the Cas9 protein and we've synthesized in tubes and we have frozen aliquots of the guide RNA. Okay. So now all we need to do is take component one up here and mix it with component two, which is our synthesized guide RNA. So we're literally, now what we're doing is we're making RNPs, okay? We pre-synthesized all these ingredients and we are mixing them together in tube to directly make the RNP. We're not relying on any of the biology to make the RNP for us. We're just going to make it ourselves. Okay. This is very popular. People will make this RNP and then now you can imagine what we're actually injecting is the RNP. And that is an active enzyme complex that is immediately ready to edit the embryo as soon as it hits that, that that cytoplasm, that germplasm. As soon as, as soon as it hits the germplasm, it's ready to get imported into the nucleus and start modifying. So this is what I would say the fastest acting, but it's also sort of the most, um, the most work in a sense that we prior had to make the Cas9 in a tube or any e. coli and then purify it. And protein purification, if you're not, if you're not familiar with it, can be an intimidating task in the lab. So we prior had to do that, and then we also prior had to mix things in the tube to make the in vitro synthesized guide RNA, okay? So this involved two sort of prerequisite steps before we could inject this, but it was faster acting, okay? So there's pluses and minuses. The pluses of this, the pluses is that it's fast acting. The minuses is that it's it takes, it takes more effort from us and it takes more intelligence and it takes more, um, it takes more intellectual labor because we're, we've done all the, we've done all the synthesis. We've done all the purification. We've done all the mixing. We've done all those reactions. Okay. In the first way to do it, where we're just sending in plasmids, I didn't previously talk about the pros, the pros of this step over here, where we're literally just sending in the plasmids. The pros is that it's easy. We just rely on the biology to make all the Cas9 and the guide RNA. We're not doing that in any of the tubes. We're literally just injecting the plasmids and we're relying on the cells of the mosquito to do this for us. So do you see how this way involves less labor, but the cons is that it's usually less efficient. It usually doesn't work as well as the case where we synthesize every everything and we deliver it okay that involves more labor but it usually works a little bit better okay so let's talk about and now i just realized there's actually a fifth way let's talk about the fourth and fifth ways to do this to do the delivery of the crispr cas9 molecules okay the fourth way fourth way we can do this is we literally just buy the RNP. There are companies now that their entire job is to just make Cas9 because this is so popular they just make Cas9 and they have a whole repertoire of Cas9s you can choose from. So we can literally just buy an enzyme Cas9 in the same way that we buy a fusion polymerase or we buy a TAC polymerase from New England Biolabs. There are companies that make the Cas9, we'll just rely on them, we just buy it, okay? And then we can just buy kits to make our guide RNA. And now when we're ready, we just mix our guide RNA with our Cas9. This is, this, is, this is what people do nowadays. The pros of this is that this is the best working. This is the fastest, quickest acting. And it's you're going to get high quality because you know that the companies have usually have very, very consistent rigorous um, quality control processes in, in, in place to keep the Cas9 of high quality. The cons, the cons is that you don't get the learning. If you're not doing it yourself, 
if you're not purifying these components yourself, sometimes you worry that key knowledge is lost in the process and key knowledge is not transferred to the people doing the experiments. So the, the con is that you don't learn as much when you do it this way. But if you've already done it before yourself and you have a lot of experience, there's sort of no downside to just transitioning to make it easier for yourself. So a lot of people will do this nowadays. Okay, so let's talk about the fifth way. The fifth way to deliver these molecules. So, and this is probably, this is a, this is a way that's becoming more and more and more popular, but it relies on a lot of experimental infrastructure that's been built up prior. So imagine you had a mosquito. Okay, this would be, let's say this is an F0 generation. And let's say you previously built a mosquito where you inserted into its genome a Cas9, okay? So you took an SP Cas9 with a nuclear localization signal. And you inserted that somewhere into the germline of that insect using all the mechanisms we've talked about in the past. Maybe you used a transposon or maybe you used a form of recombination with, it, with an integrase, okay? And in this SPCAS9, just like the plasmids we described, you put something like a nanos promoter, which is gonna be a germline promoter, okay? So this is a transgenic mosquito with green eyes. Every time, let's say it's a female, every time she lays eggs, Okay, now I'm, I'm simplifying a little bit of Mendelian genetics, but imagine she's homozygous and she made it to a homozygous. She's, they're both, they both have two copies of the NLS SPCAS9. That means all the eggs, all the eggs that she lays are going to have inside of them the genetic insert of the nuclear localization signal SPCAS9. All her eggs are going to have that, okay? And that means once her eggs are laid, as soon as those eggs start developing and as soon as they start transcribing and making messenger RNA from their own genes, they're gonna be transcribing, as long as this nanos promoter is a germline active promoter, they're gonna be transcribing Cas9. Moreover, better than that, even better than that, if you remember from the developmental biology lecture, much of insect development happens even before the egg is laid in the ovaries and we talked about how the nurse cells the nurse cells stockpile maternal transcripts and load them into the egg before it's even laid right and we've talked about how before the egg is even laid the posterior and anterior axes have already been defined okay and the way that that's conveyed is because these nurse cells are synthesizing mass quantities of maternal transcripts and depositing them into the egg. Well, if you put in the nanos promoter or a, another special promoter, that means that that Cas9, the messenger RNA for that Cas9 is gonna be actually made by the nurse cells in the ovaries. And they're gonna be making Cas9 and they're gonna be, let's say Cas9 is red, they're gonna be making Cas9 and they're gonna be pumping the Cas9 messenger RNA into the egg so that when these eggs are laid, they're already filled with Cas9, okay? So this is a clever way where if we have this insect now, if we have this insect that's already transgenic for the Cas9, it's already got it, and it's already preloading it into the eggs, the benefit of this is this reduces the amount of the components that we have to now add because the Cas9, it's already there. It's already added. We don't have to microinject that. Now all we have to worry about is delivering the guide RNA, okay? And as soon as we deliver the guide RNA in either the plasmid or in vitro synthesized, as soon as we deliver that, the RNP is gonna form and it's gonna start editing the embryo. And in different insects, you're gonna get different efficiencies between number five versus number four versus number three. There's gonna be different mechanisms of delivery that work better or worse based on your system. And so many people are focused now on optimizing the delivery of these components such that they can get high rates of modification and high efficiency of those modifications. Okay, now I wanna add away. 
I want to talk about a sixth way, which has recently been um, discovered, recently been characterized. And we used to read the paper on this, although we're not going to read the paper this year. I'll just sort of describe and give credit. This is a way that was invented from Jason Raskin's lab. He is at University or Pennsylvania State University. So he invented a way which he calls remote control, remote control delivery. And this delivery this is a very creative, very clever way to deliver this. I love this project because um, it's just super creative and it and I love it even more because it relies on sort of the inherent biology of insects. It's clearly like an, a, a device conceived of by entomologists because it relies on the inherent process of vitellogenesis which we have previously described in our insect development lecture. So again, the reason I have designed this course and given you prior concepts in the past is because they become important later. So we prior talked about the process of vitellogenesis and the process of vitellogenesis goes back to the ovaries. And what happens is when the insect knows it's gonna have babies, it has an organ called the fat body, which is in like the body of, in like the kind of like near like the gut of the insect and the fat body synthesizes vitellogenin okay so vitellogenin which is a protein and if you remember it's the yolk protein so if you imagine an egg here's the yolk uh, this is like a chicken egg same thing in the chicken egg the yolk protein has what would be like a homolog or an ortholog of vitellogenin in insects it's the same thing okay in insects, they have an egg, and the egg inside is filled with yolk protein. And if you remember correctly, the role of the yolk protein is to provide nutrients for the developing embryo, because the developing embryo can't eat. It's not a larva yet. It can't walk outside into its environment and collect nutrients. But growth itself is a vastly energy-consuming process, okay? So it needs lots of energy. And so if you remember, the fat body synthesizes vitellogenin and it secretes it into the hemolymph, okay? So vitellogenin is sort of sitting in the hemolymph and the ovaries and cells of the insect bathe in this hemolymph liquid, which is like the bloodstream of the insect. And there are signals in that vitellogenin protein which cause the ovaries to recognize it as kind of like a hormone and they uptake that into themselves. They uptake that the ovaries sort of like suck up all the vitellogenin that's in the hemolymph. The nerve cells get it, and then the nerve cells pump it into the egg. They pump it into, into the egg, okay? So that's how the egg is filled with vitellogenin. That's the process of vitellogenesis. And again, this is review, so I'm going over this a little bit quickly, but you should remember this from the last lecture. So if we were to draw out the yolk the yolk protein from yolk protein. This is the same thing as vitellogenin. Here's the N terminus. Here's the C terminus of the protein, okay? Somewhere in this protein, there's a region. Maybe it's here, maybe it's here, maybe it's here. There's a region that conveys a signal, which is a sequence of peptides, a sequence of amino acids, which tells the cells, this is the yolk protein, you want to take it up into the ovaries. Somewhere in this protein is a signal region, let's say it's here, let's say it's this one, that conveys that information, okay? So the first thing that Jason's lab did is they cut up this yolk protein into little segments. So let's say they made a segment like that, they made a segment like that, they made a segment like that, they made a segment like this, 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 okay? They cut it up into little segments and they fused all these segments to GFP, which is a fluorescent protein, okay? So they made a whole bunch of different GFP fusions that's fused to little segments, little fragments of the yolk protein. And then they tested which of these segments would make the eggs glow green. Okay, so if you see what they're doing, they're taking up little segments, assuming that one of these little segments has this signal. 
and they're fusing those to a marker, a fluorescent marker, which is gonna make the cell glow green, okay? And if the glow green region is fused also to the region that conveys the signal of uptake into the ovary, that's gonna make the eggs and the ovaries glow green, okay? So they did this, and they were able to hone down the region of the signal that when it was fused to GFP, made the ovaries glow green. So they isolated the signal of uptake into the ovaries, okay? Then what they did, okay, now they have the signal. They got the signal. Then what they did is they fused the signal to the Cas9 nucleus, okay? So then what they can do, now imagine what they can do with this. This is a very, very special, special construct with the yolk uptake signal. And I would imagine there's also gonna be an NLS in there uh, and it's probably gonna be the SP Cas9. Now this is a very, very special molecule, okay? With this molecule, all you need to do is deliver it into the hemolymph of the insect. And if you can just deliver it into the hemolymph, it's gonna float around in the body of the insect. The ovaries are gonna find it. And because it has this signal, the ovaries are gonna take it in and they're gonna deliver it to the egg. So what they did with this remote system what they did now is they've invented a system where you don't have to inject an embryo, okay? The reason we have to inject embryos is because it's very, very difficult to deliver components to the germline. Imagine you take an adult insect, okay? You take an adult insect and you try to inject something into that adult insect and deliver it. You're gonna have to take a glass needle, which is very breakable, very, very weak, okay? It almost looks like that. And you're gonna to have to try to pierce a very, very hard exoskeleton. And you're gonna to have to try to pierce it in a way where you go deep enough to a place where you can't see into the ovaries, into right into the germline, into the special spot. Do you see how hard that would be? It's like trying to inject something into the brain at a very, very specific neuron. It's, a, it's almost impossible to deliver something like that into those germlines of an adult insect. That's why we inject the eggs, because we inject the eggs because we know if we just isolate an egg, we know that right here, this region, that's gonna become the germline, okay? But it's not always easy to inject eggs either. It's not always easy to collect hundreds of eggs. And when you inject these eggs, you're taking a high pressurized, essentially a high pressurized balloon, and you're popping it with a needle. So most of the time, when you inject an embryo, all that happens is you poke it and it explodes and shit pops out and 90% of all the embryos that you inject straight off just die. So you can imagine a scenario where you inject a thousand eggs, 90% just die. That means you have a hundred that survive. Of those hundred that survive, only one is modified with the CRISPR-Cas9 in the correct way, okay? So you see how inefficient this process is. So there's been a lot of research to try to make this system more efficient. And Remot is a system that does that, okay? Remot makes the process much easier. So now with the Remot system, a remote system, I call it, I always called it Remot. It seemed like it made more sense to me, but I, it's remote, so he'll probably be mad at me. Um, but what you can do is, okay, now you can take an adult insect, and adults are a lot more hardy than an egg, okay? An adult is a, is like a living organism, it's hardened, it's, it's easier to survive. Now what you can do is you can take a needle, take that needle now, a little bit of a thicker needle, okay? And you put the fusion, the yolk fusion of the yolk uptake signal to the Cas9, and maybe you've already complexed it with its guide RNA. Okay, you've already made like the RNP. Okay, it's ready to go. But it's got this special tag that's gonna allow it to be uptaken into the ovaries. Now all you need to do is inject the body. You don't have to worry about the germline. You could inject it in the eyeball if you wanted. It's possible it could work. I mean, you would wanna do that, but you could possibly do that. All you need to do is inject it in the body, okay? And you pump this stuff 
into the body of the insect, and you just hope that a bunch of it gets into the hemolymph. When it's inside the hemolymph, it's going to get circulated around throughout the whole organism. It's going to bathe in the liquid that hold the ovaries. The ovaries are going to see that yolk uptake signal, and they're going to start uptaking it into the ovaries, and then they're going to deposit it into the eggs. And now you can imagine what's going to happen. First of all, you're hitting those eggs at the earliest they could possibly be hit because you're loading the complete RNP in before, even before they've been fertilized by sperm, okay? So then what's gonna happen is this female, if she's made it, she's got three spermatheca, which store sperm. She's gonna lay these eggs and as she lays them, she's gonna fertilize them with male from the father, okay? So she's gonna lay these fertilized eggs, which are already pre-delivered, pre-loaded with the RNP because it had been delivered and uptaken because it had that vitelogenesis uptake signal, okay? So she's literally gonna be laying, laying transgenic babies. So do you see how like, how like efficient and easy this system has now become? You can literally just make this, inject it into the body of an insect and injecting into the body of the insect is quite easy. It's not, it's not very hard. I mean, it takes a little bit of practice, but it's a lot easier than trying to inject it into an embryo, okay? So you inject it into the female, and I, if I recall from the paper, I think they get like 30% of the eggs laid are modified with the CRISPR system. And this is in comparison to, I think it's maybe like 1% of embryos would be modified via standard like microinjection methods. So this is like a drastic improvement in efficiency and ease of this system. So now if you wanna make transgenic insects, you can make them in the basement of your house with equipment that takes about, that costs about $15, okay? All you literally need is a syringe. You can get a syringe, a little syringe, and you can inject these with a very, very fine needle. Like you don't even need to have a needle puller anymore. It's just drastically decreased the cost of this. So remote, that's a good way to do it now. That's the sixth way to deliver these components. So I'll quickly, since I've talked about delivery of all these components modifications, I'll quickly just talk about selection a little bit. Um, and selection of the Cas9 systems is going to be, in some cases, depending on the gene you're modifying, similar to others. So what's very, very common is as people are studying these systems, they work on sort of the efficiency of making these work better. And when you're studying the efficiency of something, you kind of want to choose a marker that's easy. So what's very, very common in these CRISPR papers of insects is they're modifying or targeting their guide RNAs to target a very specific gene that controls eye color. So this is a common sort of trope that we've seen or a common theme that we've seen in a lot of the prior past literature and a lot of the prior past lectures where when you modify an eye color gene, it's just an easy phenotype that you can keep track of so you can measure the efficiency, okay? So in mosquitoes, oftentimes they're, the mosquitoes, mosquitoes have sort of dark eyes. And a lot of times they're targeting a gene, you don't need to remember the name, I think it's KMO, I can't, I can't remember quite precisely. But a lot of times they're targeting a gene which controls eye color. And once they, let's say this is the ORF, that conveys dark eyes in mosquitoes, if they target that with a CRISPR-Cas9 guide RNA and they somehow make a mutation which causes a frame shift, remember the double strand break repair, the blunt end repair, they smash something together, a piece gets lost, that causes a frame shift and that causes that protein to be now messed up. When those eyes are messed up, now they're going to have a different color. Usually they're kind of like white or more towards white, maybe like a maybe like a light, not orange, but maybe like a light brownish color, which is definitely not as dark as they were before. So many, many times they're using the Cas9 molecules to target a very, very visible phenotype. Another common one is phenotypes on the wings. If you mess up wing formation, um, it's just a visual thing that they can see. So they can use that to measure the efficiency of all these different delivery techniques. Okay, now I'll just extend this logic just a little bit further because you might say to yourself, well, well what the hell is the purpose of just changing eye color? Like that, that's kind of just like a waste of time. Well, not if you're just measuring the efficiency, but I understand what you're saying if you say that. If you say like, well, 
why are we spending all this time just changing the eye colors? Like, can't we change something that is actually useful and sort of a biotechnological purpose in the sense of, in that sense of it? And that's a true, that's a legit criticism. Um, and there are now studies, many, many studies, trying to modify these organisms in a way that's going to sort of benefit human health. So I'll give just one example of this, which was a paper that, again, we used to read in this class, um, which is a very, very good paper. Um, and what they did is, if you recall back to the sterile insect technique lectures, if you recall back to the sterile insect technique lecture, one of the four things you need to deliver sterile insect technique is you need a means of sex separation. So that means you need a means of separating out males from females, okay? And that's not always an easy issue. And you can imagine why that's important in the case of the mosquito. So say you're gonna do a sterile insect technique for mosquitoes, okay? Mosquitoes are a unique system where the females, the females are the only ones that bite. Males are just sort of like nice guys that go around and they just suck flower nectar. They're kind of like just really, really nice nice creatures okay females are the ones that bite you and the reason they bite you is because they need your blood because they need the protein and the nutrients in your blood to synthesize eggs so they're only biting you because they need to take care of their own babies but females are like the only ones that are sort of like nasty so you can imagine if we want to do sterile insect technique with mosquitoes we want to rear a bunch of sterile males okay and we want to release a bunch of sterile males and by doing that, we're going to be actually temporarily increasing the population of sterile of males, of male mosquitoes. But the reason nobody cares is because males don't bite, okay? But let me turn that around. Let's say it was different. Let's say males bit. Imagine there was an earth where in that earth, the mosquitoes, both males and females, took blood meals. They bit you, okay? Humans would not be comfortable with releasing thousands of sterile males, regardless of whether they were sterile or not, because you're going to re be releasing and increasing the population of mosquitoes that bite humans, okay? Humans are not going to be happy with that. It's like, imagine going to a neighborhood and being like, well, I'm going to help you out, but I'm also, I'm going to help you out by releasing a bunch of creatures that bite you, okay? They're not going to be comfortable with that. So the reason that sterile insect technique works with mosquitoes is because of this unique biology that only the females bite and what we're gonna be releasing are the males which don't bite you, okay? So now, now you can imagine the scenario of why, why we need to separate out the sexes. We can't just release a mixture of a bunch of females because the females will, will bite. So we need a means to quickly separate males from females. Now imagine there was a gene and call that gene Nix, because that's his name. Imagine there was a gene, okay, that turned you into a female, okay? This is the sex control gene. This is the master regulator for sex in mosquitoes, in Aedes aegypti. There's literally a gene, kind of, kind of like a funky hox gene. There's literally a gene in the mosquito that if you have it being expressed, it turns you into a female, okay? So imagine now in our sterile insect technique laboratory, we target the Nix gene with the CRISPR Cas9 guide RNA. Okay, so the guide RNA has a region that matches the Nix gene and targets the Cas9 nuclease to cut the Nix gene up into little pieces. Now, all of our mosquitoes, whether they're female or male or not, they're all going to have a disrupted Nix gene. And so they're all going to develop as males. So if we do this in our population of insects, which we're gonna release for the sterile insect technique, we can use CRISPR to very, very quickly and efficiently, essentially, convert all the females to males. We can sex change them using CRISPR. And then now we're not releasing any females into the population, nobody extra gets bit, and our sterile insect technique works. So you can see that as a clear example of why these these things might possibly be useful for modifying insects and why those modified insects might be useful to us as humans. So I will end it there. Next we will talk about, I suspect, gene drive.
see you next time